afternoon. Okay. We are so grateful that you have joined us this afternoon in this sacred, safe place where we can acknowledge our grief, where we can seek together the hope that is ours in Christ our Lord. Will you join me in prayer? God of abundant mercy, you have given us grace to pray with one heart and one voice, even though our hearts are broken and our voices tremble with grief and sorrow. Comfort, comfort, Lord, your holy people. Comfort those of us who sit in darkness, mourning neath our sorrow's load. Speak to us of the peace that awaits us, of the balm of healing for our weary and wounded souls. We ask all of this, trusting in the promise you have made to hear the prayers of two or three who have gathered in the name of your holy child, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can either use the bulletin or the hymnal, whatever you would prefer. We're going. If you want to use the hymnal, it's number 211. I personally like to see the notes. So number 211, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 6. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
true and real, and we want to honor those today. I do get distracted, and I love that there are babies crying, but bear with me. <laughs> well, I am Lisa Thompson. I am a pastor in residence here. That means um, I have all the fun bells and whistles of being an ordained minister, and I don't get paid, but I get to come and do the things that they ask me to do, that I am passionate about doing, and it seems to work really well right now. So thank you for letting me step in for one of your very familiar faces. Loss is vast. It does not have defined boundaries of space or of time. And truthfully, most persons on any given day can experience loss in varying degrees. From a tragic loss to an inconvenient loss. It can all begin to impact our lives in ways that create paths that can be very unexpected. Well, this service here today is a time to honor those losses, regardless of the scale, and to be able to name it. So I'm going to do something a little different, and I want to invite you to close your eyes. And if you are not familiar with this, this is a singing bowl and I'm going to allow the bowl to sing. And I just invite you to listen and to be present for a moment. Let's close our eyes. Loss. Hope. Shame, rage, void, hope, lost touch, lost laughter, lost trust. I believe that one of the things that can be so powerful about loss is that it can feel very much out of our control. Something is happening in my life and I don't want it and I don't want to feel this way. And yet, here it is. It's as close as my shadow. While we are here to name the loss, we are also here knowing and hoping that even amidst this shadow, nothing ends here in this darkness of the shadow. We know as believers that there is light. And sometimes we need help. We need each other praying for us. We need someone sitting with us. Sometimes we need to hear over and over and over again about God's love 
more than we pick up the phone and look at social media. I wouldn't say sometimes, but definitely. The ability to have hope is a gift that we have been given within our being. There are many obstacles to keep us from seeing that truth, and yet it is still true. This idea of loss and of hope reminds me of many of the stories that I've actually been teaching to the children downstairs every Sunday. Some of the stories come from the Old Testament and some come from the New. And the situations that keep happening are simply shocking. Can you imagine that in the Bible, these shocking situations? It's really interesting to look at it with the eyes of children because they are shocking. Abraham and Sarah, they're of advanced age and they are told that they will now begin to start their family. Esau's brother, Jacob, took his birthright with the help of his mother. And then Mary, jump into the New Testament now, a lot of time has passed, bear with me. Mary is a young girl, not much older than some of the ch children that I teach, becomes pregnant with God's child while she's engaged, not married. And then the really cool part comes in where I get to tell the kids, guess what? All of these people are related. Genealogically, for real. It's like a thing. And they're like, what? It's all happening in this one family. How do they or we get through experiences in times in our lives that are sometimes draped in loss. Not to mention all the emotions that loss can then surprise us with. I did spend a few minutes considering a delicate way of saying this and decided that I would not be delicate and I was just going to rip off the bandage. Is everyone ready? The truth is, there comes a point in the journey of loss where we have a choice to make. <clears throat> we can be prisoners of hope, or we can be prisoners of loss. There will come a time when we can choose loss or hope in the midst of loss. For those who are here and they are in the midst of very raw and numb realities of loss within this season, you're not alone. And what you are feeling is okay. It is okay to hurt. It is okay to cry. It is okay to turn down an invitation to watch It's a Wonderful Life and say, I would like to watch Die Hard instead. It's also okay not to attend all the things that are out there and ready for you. And my hope for all of this in this decision-making time is that when those invitations are there, when those opportunities are presented, that we take time to consult our hearts and God. Because grief from loss can be immense, overwhelming, consuming, and it, it can take over a space much larger than a shadow, right? It can paralyze us and harden us in ways that may create an armor of bitterness or anger or resentment 
the happiness that others are having isn't fair and we're going to justify the isolation and the exile that we create for ourselves. And it's for this reason that I bring us to this Old Testament scripture because it invites us to claim the identity as prisoners of hope. Now, Zechariah was speaking to a community in post-exile, coming through to the other side. And we heard in our song, Emmanuel, that exile is very real. And often that loss, that experience of loss, has a lot of similar tendencies. So the people that Zechariah is speaking to are on the other side of exile, de declaring this prophecy. And part of this prophecy becomes very familiar to us as a church. Listen to this, just a couple of verses before Zechariah 9, verse 9, before we get to 12. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humbled and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Well, after I read this, I have all kinds of questions. And I really, if, if truth be told, I would love to ask these questions with each person individually and just talk and get into it. And we don't have time for that right now, but that doesn't mean it can't happen another day. But I want to ask the question, what, is, what does it mean to return to a stronghold? Why do we need safety or a stronghold after loss? And truthfully, like, I, I read this and I think, I don't want to be a prisoner of anything. Why do I have to be a prisoner of hope to have hope? These are all questions that I would love to wonder with. <clears throat> but what I do understand is that since this is written post-exile, there's even more for us to experience with it. The loss itself throws us into that idea and that feeling of exile. <clears throat> Post-exile, that's different for everyone. Come home. All of this has happened and you have been through so much. Come home, return. What if we allow these words to sink into our bodies and our minds and our spirits as we have experienced loss in our lives? Come home, <clears throat> return to safety, return to life, to milk and honey, to love, to hope. You don't have to do this alone. The truth is we are changed by loss and and God is still with us. When we think of returning home, when we think, I don't want to go back home, because that reminds me of what I have lost. What if we return to something different? What if home and safety become something new? Something we haven't experienced yet or imagined. It could be a new time and a new place, new people. And I believe that as prisoners of hope, we allow the breath of God to reside within us. So this is vital to living in hope. As prisoners of hope, we don't always want hope, let's be honest. I don't always want it. Sometimes I'm having none of it. I need that time with my shadow and my darkness. And I don't want to speak of hope. And then I thank God 
that that breath of God is in me, that I am a prisoner of hope, that it's not gone, it's not lost from me. It resides there. It sustains us when we cannot do anything but cry out and feel the pain. When hope is a part of us, there is a chance that we can return post-exile. Allowing this hope to be a part of our whole selves. This is one of my favorite concepts, if you know me. Our whole beings, our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. That is not an assurance that we are never going to have loss again. It is not an assurance that we are not going to be in pain or be disappointed. It is our assurance, it is our knowledge of ourselves that when we do, when we do go through that, we're not alone. We are not in exile without hope, without God, without anyone. We're in exile and in the back of our minds, in our in our innermost being, we know this is not forever. I'd like to take us back to that band-aid that I wanted to rip off, where we have a choice to make. Sarah laughed. And yet she still bore Isaac by Abraham. Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And truthfully, that's a really difficult one to explain to kids why that was going to be okay and justified. Other than, you know, maybe even when we make tr troubling choices, God's still with us. God doesn't give up on us. Because of that, there is hope. Hope is there. Yet, strangely for us in this world and in this society where we live now, right, it sometimes is less painful to live as prisoners of fear. That's, that's something that the world can really get behind. That's something that society loves to foster. Because the world really likes to push against hope, telling us in no uncertain terms, it's the hope that kills you. Who's heard that? It's not the terrible times, the things that we've gone through, those are, we can survive that, but it's the hope through those times that, that it will eventually end and it, that's what gets you. Well, I believe that when someone we love dies, we can feel many, many things. And the truth is, not one feeling is more valid over another. I recently sat with two sisters whose father had passed away. And they have very different experiences. And that is okay. We can feel a deep sadness, even when the life was beautiful and long-lived, when that death comes. And then within that sadness, we may look at the world and all that we see reflected back at us is sadness. I don't know if this makes sense, but it happens. And then what if we feel anger about the loss, a marriage that has ended. We are so angry and we look out and there's so many things to be angry about in the world. And so the world spins and is reflecting back our feelings to us and our mind spins. And suddenly we're reinforcing this idea that, well, hope is a pretty naive idea. Where is the power in hope, after all? As a young chaplain, 
in the pediatric intensive care unit, I was with a family when their child died, and it was extended family. I mean, this is like, you know, back in the early part of the century, which that's a thing now, right? The early part of the century here. And so pre-COVID, obviously, and we're in the room, and it's extended family. It's not just mom and dad. It's sisters. It's grandma. It's, it's a group. And this child has died, and I'm getting chills now because I can relive these moments, and nothing about it seems fair to me. And as the chaplain, I've gone to seminary, I've done the things, <clears throat> I, I know the prayers to pray. And this family completely shocked me. Like they didn't follow the rule book of grief. They stood up and held hands, and they started singing praises to God. And they were crying. And they were loving. And they were filled with hope and promise amidst this great loss. I had never seen anything like it. It showed me a possibility that was beyond my understanding. And reading this scripture, it came alive. And our moments were connected together once again, and I, I got it. Being a prisoner to hope doesn't mean that if death happens in your family, you have to stand up and sing praises. That's not what I'm saying, but it can look so many different ways. And the point is that it, it dwells within us and it leads us and it gives us life. We can hope and be sad at the same time because we know there is no victory in death, and we know that the light will overcome the darkness of death. And we share that scripture at funerals because we believe it is true. And so we share the truth because it is also hope. We're not always going to feel it immediately, and that is okay. when we allow ourselves to call that hope to reside within us, we're moving toward that stronghold, to having that space of safety to return to post-exile, that we can become prisoners of hope in the midst of death and in the midst of loss. That's how we are able to then choose hope when the time comes. Now Sarah and Abraham, Jacob, Mary, they were all prisoners of hope and a thousand or so and some centuries passed and then Mary surprised everyone by having a baby that was to be called the Son of God. Can you imagine going through all of this without being a prisoner to hope. That stronghold, it gives us a place to stand. It gives us a place to sit. It gives us a place to kneel, to raise our fists in the air, to cry out in anger to God, to collapse in pain in our bodies, in our minds, and in our spirits. That is what that stronghold is. It's not you are perfect and fixed and ready to go and act like nothing's happened. That's not what a stronghold in a safe place is. It's a place to be who we are, human and feeling and hurting. And it's a place to find that hope again. Finding hope is most easily found, I would say, I don't know, I don't know if that's fair. Maybe not most easily found. 
Let's just throw it out there without all these caveats. Finding hope. <laughs> when you realize that you don't have control over X or Y or Z, and the only thing you have control over is your next choice, hope can really shine like a beacon and be that choice that transcends reason <coughs> and you can make that choice every day, you can make that choice every hour, you can make it sometimes minute by minute to feel that. As the church, we are here to remember that this is a season of hope. And even amidst all that we are experiencing, I thank God for that hope. And for the gift and the ability to choose hope. Gracious and creative God, give us open hearts to experience flutters of love and hope amidst the pain of our loss. Grant that our eyes may have wisdom to see where your light and hope shines. In a culture so comfortable to speaking words that cause pain or narratives that deliver judgment, give our mouths the conviction to proclaim with confidence I choose hope. God, allow this hope to change my life and to be your hope in the world. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. You'll turn in your hymnals to number 534. We are going to sing Be Still My Soul, all three verses, 534. And you can use your bulletin if you would like as well. Thank you. 
This first candle we light to remember those whom we have loved who have died. We pause to remember their names, their faces, their voices, the memory that binds them to us in this season of expectation when all creation waits for the light. Together we say, we remember them with love. May God's eternal love surround them. The second candle we light is to redeem the pain of loss. Loss of relationships, loss of trust, loss of jobs, loss of health, loss of faith, and loss of joy. We acknowledge and embrace the pain of the past, O oh God, and we offer it to you, asking that into our wounded hearts and open hands, you will place the gift of peace, shalom. And together we say, we remember that through you, all things are possible. Refresh, restore, renew us, O oh God, and lead us into your future. This third candle we light is to remember ourselves this Christmas time. We pause and remember these past weeks and months, and for some of us years, that have been heavy with our burdens. We lay before you the disbelief, the anger, the sadness, the hurts, the fear, we lay it all before you. We lay before you the ways we have fallen short and the times we have spent blaming ourselves and you. And together we say, we remember that the winter be upon us and though the night be dark, dawn will come again and dawn defeats darkness. The fourth candle is lit to remember our faith, the gift of light and hope that God offers us in the story of Christmas, which began in a time of fear and uncertainty in a lonely stable, where Emmanuel was found in the lowliest of circumstances. We remember that God who shares our life promises us comfort and peace and together we say let us remember the one who shares our burdens who brings the truth who bears the light and who journeys with us into all our tomorrows one of the things that we each know is that in grief it's important to name to name our loss and one of the ways that we do that is by lighting a candle. So we take the light from the Advent wreath because it symbolizes the light of Christ. And as you take the light from the, the pails, the candles there, may you know that the Christ who is among us is the one who is with us and that we are never, ever alone. At the end of the service, you're invited to take this candle with you, and in moments when you find yourself lonely or afraid, full of sadness or grief, you light the candle in remembrance and in honor of that loss. You're welcome to come as the Spirit leads. Wherever God is present, there is freedom to participate or not. Please know this is a time of sacred silence as we remember together. If you need to remain seated and want us to bring a candle and a 
lighter to you. So just let us know. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for your faithfulness and the truth of your word and the promises that give us hope today. We're thankful that your love for us is very real and active to the point that you draw near to us when we are brokenhearted. You come close. You know us completely. You know how to relieve all that's going on within us that sometimes is out of control. You draw near to the brokenhearted and you save those of us who are crushed in spirit. You understand that in our own strength, we're not able to go forward. We are slowed and sometimes completely halted by grief and loss. But we are encouraged to know that you keep track of our tears. You know our thoughts all together. And as you draw near and bring your saving strength to us, I pray that we might trust you no, what our, no matter what our emotions may tell us, that we may be confident in the truth of your word, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. 
and that there is so much more coming to those who put their trust in you. And we look forward to that day when we shall all be reunited together with the Lord forever. Never again to feel <coughs> sorrow. Never again to say goodbye. Forever together with you, Lord. And that does give us hope today. But we need your grace for each new challenge, each new day while we are here. And we're thankful for your promised strength in our time of weakness, that your grace is sufficient, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As our service concludes, you are welcome to stay here in the chapel and take time to pray and reflect. As you choose to leave, um, we do ask that you leave in silence. We respect the time and place that people are right now. Receive now this benediction. Go forth into this day and into this season with the confidence 